Welcome back, everybody. This is Eric and Kevin here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Yes, Kevin is with the channel full time now, so you're going to be seeing more of Kevin here in uh, various videos. Mainly, Kevin comes out to play when we start talking about black powder or historical guns. You know, he's kind of the history buff among us. Well, myself included. We, right. we both uh, really love history and everything. Uh, today, we've got a top five guns video for you. We're going to be talking about the top five most innovative rifles. Now, when you think innovation, you think rifles that, one, are copied, uh, one, that stand the test of time, all right, three, that have really unique design attributes about them that make them very, very special for the time that they were made, and, uh, and they really just stand the test of time. Uh, we've got some pretty uh, unique guns here, but then also ones that are very noticeable, you know. Uh, we're going to try to go somewhat chronologically and kind of keep them in order for when they were made. Uh, but what would be number one in the list, Kevin? Well, number one has to be the Henry, the 1860 Henry. It was, uh, it was quite innovative for its time. You know, I mean, being able to have a rifle that held more than one round, able to get those rounds out pretty quick. It did have its design flaws, of course, like anything that's you know initially innovative. But Benjamin Tyler Henry invented this, and you know it saw limited service during the American Civil War. But I mean, after the war, even I mean, and then everybody and their brothers copied this gun. I mean, look, I mean, it's a lever gun. Everybody knows a lever gun when they see it. And this is kind of isn't where it started, but it's where it ended up. And this was the, the most successful one when That's it right. came out. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it has its quirks about it. You know, this is an actual <clears throat> new Henry produced rifle. You can still buy the 1860. Henry makes the original yep. in a variety of different configurations. This one has a brass receiver. This is one of the first guns of its type to really utilize a like cartridge contained, like an actual cartridge, a right. metallic cartridge, which was a pretty big thing back then. You know, right. the originals were rimfire, uh, so kind of an early form of, uh, you know, setting off a cartridge, you know, it didn't use a center fire uh, primer. Now, this 1860 is a modern one, and of course it's set up in 4440 center fire. Right. But the originals were rimfire, and it really was an innovative gun for It really time. was, and Henry's done such a wonderful job bringing these things out, man. I mean, they're just beautiful rifles. They got that weight. You know, the originals were kind of heavy. They were like nine pounds. This one's very close to it. I mean, it's just an awesome, awesome rifle. They are. There's not, not enough good things you can say about these things, and they're so I, I pretty. I think innovation is definitely there. I mean, when you look at something <clears throat> like that, that really for its time was one of the most innovative guns at the time. Right. Uh, so we're going to kind of move up chronologically. Uh, fast forward to 1898. And uh, the French invented smokeless powder around 1890 mm. or so, 1891. And uh, the LaBelle rifle was one of the first guns to use smokeless powder. But the LaBelle wasn't really as copied quite as much. The Mauser was copied a lot. You know, in fact, our uh, 03 Springfield rifle uh, that we used was pretty much, a, for the most part, a verbatim copy of the 98. Uh, in 1898, that's how it gets its uh, model designation, is the Mauser Model 98. This is an original 98 that would have been used in World War I. Uh, it's got the roller coaster sights, so that's a very early 98 there. Uh, the most innovative thing about this gun is the fact that it's a bolt-action rifle with two forward locking lugs. You also have a safety lug, so it has a third lug right here in the rear, so a very strong action. And it was the first weapon of its type to utilize a fast-feeding stripper clip. Mm -hmm. uh, as our boys found out on San Juan Hill, okay, we were up against uh, the Spanish military was armed with the Mauser, well, they had the 95s, right. I believe. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that gun acquitted fairly well to them, okay? They had 7mm Mauser rifles with fast-loading stripper clips. Our boys were armed with crags. They were definitely outgunned and outclassed. The 7mm Mauser rifle outclassed the uh, 3040 Crag by a long margin in terms of distance, power, not to mention the fast-feeding stripper clips of the Mauser rifle. Uh, you know, our boys, the only reason they were able to get up that hill as well as they did was all the Gatling guns right. that they brought out. So they had withering 4570 Gatling gun firepower, right. and they were just raining Gatling gun projectiles down on that hill in order for our men to advance up the hill and take the objective. But the Mauser rifle, it, it was definitely seen as a very formidable weapon at the time, and it's what led the War Department to go, hey, we have to replace this crag right. because it just doesn't <clears throat> load fast enough. They really saw the magic of the Mauser at the time. Likely, more than, more than likely, they probably captured rifles, and they probably reverse-engineered them, and they, and they developed the Springfield. And then Springfield came around in 03. In 1903, so, so it was yeah. in 1898, we were fighting the Spanish. 1903, we had a new gun. I mean, it was that quick. 
they saw that they were outclassed that fast. They got right on it and they basically copied. They made they took everything you could do with the Mauser and made it a little bit better. I like the 1903 better. I think it's a great gun. Sure. But man, the Mauser is where it's at. But where it gets its heritage is awesome. And then here's another interesting thing about the Mauser guys. Mauser action is one of the most copied actions for, for rifles around. Look at all the different sporting rifles that are produced nowadays. Anything with forward locking mm -hmm. lugs, controlled feed was another very important aspect of the Mauser rifle. Uh, with a controlled feed rifle, I could be laying in a ditch sideways and I could work this gun yep. sideways. I can work it upside down. I can do whatever I need to do. And that round is going to control itself and feed into the chamber. So the controlled feed was a very big important part of the Mauser rifle. It's a wonderful hunting rifle, you know, uh, Ruger M77s, right. use controlled feed. Uh, there's several different like variants of the CZs that are out there that use controlled feed, uh, forward locking lugs. It's just a great action. It, it makes for a good sporting rifle. It's a real good service weapon. It's one of the, the few German designs that's not stupidly over-engineered. Some right. of their designs were very over-engineered. Yeah, they were. And it, I mean, it just won't go away. The Mauser action will be around forever. It is. It's, 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 it's one of the say. most copy, and there's yep. so many different Mauser variants, so that's definitely worth being on the list of innovative rifles. So we're going to move up the ladder next to the M1 Garand. Now this right. is probably one of the most important developments in small arms. Really, in my opinion, the Garand is one of the most important inventions uh, you know, there is, you know, right. Patton said it was the greatest battle implement ever devised. It was our revenge for, for the being outclassed with the Mauser. We weren't going to do it again. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, uh, the, the inventor of the Garam was a Canadian, and he originally designed this rifle as a 10 shot in a caliber called 276 Peterson. And it was a ten, the original Garam was a 10 shot rifle. A lot of people don't know yep. that uh, in 276 Peterson, which would have been an awesome It would have been great. But uh, I believe, I don't remember if it was Patton or if it was one of the other generals. They are like, hey, uh, you know, we've got four billion right, rounds of piles. M2 ball laying right. around. Well, well, we'll accept this rifle if you can redesign it to fire M2 ball. Yep. So keeping the original kind of specs of the rifle, they redesigned it to accept M2 ball ammunition. And then the rest is history. Uh, these guns were developed around the late 30s. I believe the first one started shipping around like early early to mid 38, I believe, or 39. Yeah, something like that. Some, somewhere in that range. And Just they actually, in time. They actually had to down uh, charge the 30 6 to not bend the op rods. They found they were bending op rods. Yep. So they asked, actually, one thing that they did, they actually downloaded some of the yep. some of the 30 6 But I mean, man, you talk about a hard hitting rifle. Yep. I mean, they couldn't, we just, man, we were wearing them out with this rifle. So the, so the Grand, you know, one of the <clears> most <throat> interesting aspects of it, it's the first rifle of its type, but it's a uh, M-block stripper clip fed, uh, eight shot repeater. So you have your clip and it is a clip. Yeah, M -block you clip, push yep. it down in there and it locks, you let go, you load the first round, you fire all eight shots on the last round, the stripper clip pops out, locks action to the rear and you're ready to load eight more. Right. So it was a semi-automatic battle rifle, 30 alt six, plenty of power, plenty of range. Uh, it was just a wonderful gun for its time. Right. Yeah, he took the man licker idea with the in-block clip and then perfected it. I mean, you know, he 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 was a brilliant man. I mean, that rifle, you can't say enough good things about it. And it's kind of, you know, the American rifle to me. Yeah. You know, you have the M16s and the ARs, but that's the American rifle. It's got such it's got such a soul to it. Yeah, yeah. That that, you know, I think every American gun owner connects to. Yeah. And that, you know, they're just great rifles. You can't sing enough phrases. Well, you know, them. and the thing is too on the Garand, you know, it may not have been used in service as long as some of the other uh, rifles that are on this table, but the Grand also paved the way for very important designs. Like behind us, we've got a, uh, an Italian BM-59, which right. is built off a of Grand receiver. So they saw the value of the Grand action. Of course, weapons like the M1A, M14, those are basically, uh, you know, built off M1 of... Carbine. Well, yeah, they're, they're kind of built more or less off of a Garand style action. I mean, M1A and M14 is obviously a very modified gun over a Garand, but they're very, very similar. Very similar. Okay, and they really saw the value in that, and that the Garand led way to uh, what would eventually be another service rifle that we used, which was M14. Still It's based very much on the Garand, and they're still in service it's today. In so service. that really, in my <clears throat> opinion, speaks volumes for the Garand. Mm -hmm. So going uh, forward in time a little bit to around 1945, 46, somewhere in that ballpark, uh, a very uh, infamous tank <laughs> commander during World yep. War II, Mikhail Kalishnikov, invented a little gun. Oh, what do we call it? The AK-47? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've heard of that before. So 
What are your thoughts on the AK-47? This is a 74 mm -hmm. on the table, but right. you get the idea. It's the same thing. I mean, the 47 was was such a, I mean, it, to this day, it has a nostalgia to it. It has, it has such a, 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 I mean, it's so important, you know, and the, the man didn't get any, you know, didn't get any, any royalty from it. The Soviet Union owned the patent and, you know, he didn't make, he didn't make any money from it. He probably did in his later life, but when he, when he made it, it was, it belonged to the government and he was, he was a patriot. He loved his country. You know, he'd take it or leave it. He loved this country, and he wanted to make a rifle for his guys, and he did a, he did the job, and it's still doing it today. I mean, there's dudes that are diehard AK fans that will, you know, go to go to war with you over how great the AK is, and with warrant. I mean, it's a great platform, you know, piston driven. I mean, there's nothing you just can't say anything really bad about it. I agree. You know, uh, the the AK. You know, I guess compared to today's technologies that are out there, the <clears throat> AKs might be a little bit antiquated by today's standards. But why is it innovative? Why is it such a copy design? Well, for one, the Germans during you know World War II had the Sturmgewehr, mm -hmm. and they they were really one of the first groups of folks to take a stamping and make a gun out of stamped sheet metal like that. You mm -hmm. know, the, if you look at uh, the lineage of the Sturmgewehr, and you look at the G3, you look at uh, MP5s, you look at anything that uses that kind of typical, uh, very uniquely HK stamped right. receiver, they were really the first people to use stampings. But Kalashnikov was one of the first people to understand the value of a very, very simple rifle. You know, the stamped, <clears throat> uh, the early guns were milled they guns. Were, they were milled, they were milled guns. But as time went on and they started to stamp these out, you know, that stamped receiver is awesome because it's cheap to make. And this was a rifle that, in my opinion, it's the first rifle of its type to really lend itself really, really well to like mass manufacturing. Oh yeah. You know, the AK-47 is not a gun that you're going to tinker with like you would an, uh, an AR or something, which right. we're going to get to in a moment. The AR is very modular. The AK really lends itself more to being manufactured. So like you select the components, you mm -hmm. say, all right, this is how we're going to build the gun, and you build the thing. you build the thing. I mean, but, how many but, different manufacturers are there? Oh yeah, Gosh, but, I mean, but they, they really lend themselves well as a uh, great infantry weapon. They're very, very simple to use. I mean, it's just, it's easy. You know, you pull her back and load it, you put the safety on, you go about your business. You could train an individual on how to use this gun in a day, if that, if that's if right. you, you could train a conscript in 10 minutes right. on how to not get themselves killed with it. Chambered in a great caliber. Chamber, chambered in a great intermediate caliber, and this is one of the first firearms of its type, other than the Sturmgewehr. Right. The Sturmgewehr did use an 8mm eight, eight, eight Kurs cartridge, which was an intermediate cartridge. So it wasn't really the first one to, to really uh, to do that, but it was the first of its type that was issued in such mass quantities uh, like the AK round was. The 762 by 39 is a great intermediate cartridge. It gave <coughs> way to things like 300 blackout, 6.8 right. spec, uh, gave way to the whole intermediate cartridge world. Really. Well, see, that whole that whole thought process really changed the face of warfare. I mean, it did. you got to think before that, we're using 8 millimeter, we're using 30-06, we're using 76254, yep. right? And so you know, when they realized that we didn't need all that powerhouse and they were able to get it in a package like this that held 30 rounds, yep. I mean, who are you kidding? Though? Well, the Why Germans the it? Germans discovered in World War II that an intermediate cartridge <laughs> right. had value. You know, at the time, the, the, the K-98 was in use in World War II by the German military, and they thought, oh, okay, well, we're going to have standoff warfare at five, 600 we're yards. Again, they right. were thinking like trench warfare in World War One, and they were thinking, oh, well, we're going to be shooting people at 600 yards. And they found that most of the engagements were incurring, you know, between two and 300 yards, right. where the Sturmgewehr actually fared very well. I mean, the early versions of the Sturmgewehr, you know, Hitler even didn't even know about no. the Sturmgewehr. They tried to hide the project from him because he didn't like the idea of trying to develop a new gun. But the troops that had the Sturmgewehr loved it because they realized the importance of intermediate cartridge uh, in a rifle like that. It was a great rifle. You know, when Kalashnikov designed the AK, he deemed that it was a machine that had one simple purpose. He, he, he thought, you know, he understood mechanical devices and he understood that the piston operation, keeping it simple, very few moving parts, very simple uh, process of manufacturing, it really was the first of its kind, mm -hmm. you know, in my, in my humble opinion. You know, they, they did the milled receivers, then they, you know, eventually started doing stampings. I don't know when they started doing stamp receivers. I'm not sure either. I'm not sure either. It was but, very early on. I mean, it was pretty yeah. evident. That but the was, first ones were milled. Though. Yeah, for sure. And there's nothing wrong with a milled AK. Like, no. nice, solid feel. You get a little bit more weight. Kind of a chunky gun, you know. <clears throat> I've had both. I think I prefer, I mean, I prefer stamp personally for the weight. I don't see. I mean, I don't see why not having a stamp one. I don't think it really affects anything sure. accuracy-wise or anything. Well, you know, another interesting point, and we'll move on because this section's <laughs> getting a little bit long. But 
the piston operation of the AK, when you're talking about innovation, mm -hmm. that's something that gets copied a heck of a lot. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, that's, that's the feature of the gun that everybody wants. That's yeah. the feature. Yep. So, yeah. It keeps all the crap in the gunk up here mm -hmm. in this area and not getting back in the action, keeping the action running pretty clean. Right. So, really good gun. And, you know, again, for the time it was designed and what they had to work with to design it, it was a really innovative gun and it continues to be used uh, to this day for good reason. So, moving up to around the mid 50s. Yep. So, AR Stoner. Fast forward a little bit, we get to Eugene Stoner. Mm hmm. Yep, he uh, makes the AR-10. A lot of people don't realize it was the AR-10, not the AR-15 that he initially designed. It was initially in 308. Uh, he was. They were trying to come up with a design to compete with the fouls and all those kind of things. Sure. Uh, Lightweight. They were going right. for that lighter weight. That lighter weight, you know. But man, let me tell you, everybody knows the AR-15. You know, if you see uh, the so-called assault weapon, if you see a picture of an assault weapon, it's usually this. That's everybody right. knows the AR-15, and it's a great man. This is the bee's knees to me. I mean, these. You know, I love my old guns, but when it comes down, and I have way more older guns than I do anything else, but my tool, my gun that I use for life and liberty is an AR-15. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that's just the way it is. You know, it, early on, the AR-15 got a really bad rap in Vietnam. You know, some of the troops didn't understand completely how to care for them properly. Mm -hmm. Some of the early uh, ball powders they were issuing in the early issue ammunition fouled really bad, so the guns got a really bad rap for reliability issues. Once those issues were worked out, they switched up propellants, they issued proper cleaning materials, they gave the troops better training. Because you have to think, during the Vietnam War, a lot of troops were training with M14s. Right. And then you drop in country and they hand you an M16. You're like, what the heck is this? What is this thing? And they yeah. go, all right, well, Charlie's that way, go for it. Yeah. So the gun initially got a pretty bad rap, but as they got the kinks worked out of it, they determined, hey, you know, this thing's awesome. One of the most distinctive features of the AR-15 platform early on, direct gas impingement, mm -hmm. uh, which was not really a new concept. The Jungmann, uh, you know, the Swedish Jungmann rifle, mm -hmm. very early on used direct gas impingement to great effect. Very right. reliable, clean burning. Uh, also, direct gas impingement lends itself to very good accuracy. You're not getting a lot of barrel whip. It's a very, very good system to maintain accuracy in the rifle. So they were, they were generally pretty accurate. Uh, they eventually had to change a twist on the early guns. They determined right. that they were using a little bit too slow of a twist. They sped up the twist, increased the weight of the bullet a little bit, and they found, hey, these things shoot great. It's just the initial com uh, com combination of uh, features in the early ARs left a bad taste in some people's mouth. You listen to guys that fought in Vietnam, they say it's probably the crappiest gun. They hated them. But after they got the kinks worked out, it's been in service a long time. The AR and variants of which have been around a good minute. And also, Eugene Stoner, brilliant man, also designed a ton of other awesome guns that a lot of people don't even hear about, such as like the Stoner 63. This is not a real 63, but this is a copy of the 63. But you can see it's definitely got some awesome uh, you know, features to it. It almost looks kind of like a baby M60. Um, a lot of these guns were issued to Navy SEALs and Special Forces in Vietnam. And the troops that had the 63s in Vietnam loved them. Uh, they're, they're very, very rare, but that's another stoner design is the Stoner 63. He's also credited with inventing the Ultimax, mm -hmm. which is an awesome machine gun. And then he also invented the AR-7 survival mm -hmm. rifle. Many right. people are familiar mm -hmm. with, uh, with that. So you could go on all day about people like Kalashnikov, people uh, you know, like uh, Stoner, you know, the Mausers. Uh, you know, these designers, their names are ingrained yep. in people's minds for a reason Forever. because they've made some really innovative guns. I mean, there's just a handful of people that are sitting on this table <laughs> that the firearms world would be completely different if they weren't around doing it. That's right. I mean, think about it. Just, I mean, 10 people, say, for instance. Oh, I know. And that's it. I mean, I know. everything you know and love and do about there, firearms. There, there's a lot of exist. firearms designers whose names <clears throat> are household names, and the people on this table are definitely some of them. Right. I mean, you can't forget guys like Browning. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, there, there's so many awesome gun designers that just have brilliant minds, and their inventions are <clears> awesome, <throat> and I'm certainly not trying to say that their inventions don't deserve to be on this table, but... Every Five Guns video has a wild card. We're going to break out the wild card. This is a number six mm -hmm. that I think is a very, very innovative gun and deserves to be mentioned in this video. So let me grab it and we'll show it to you. All right. Well, it shouldn't come at a mystery that uh, a gun that I think deserves to be on this list is the Barrett M107. Now, this is a 107. Uh, Ronnie's first design, Ronnie Barrett designed the uh, M82. And the thing is, w what really to me is very important about the 107 and the 82 is that everybody told Ronnie he couldn't do it. Right. 
you know, the they said the U.S. military will never buy a man portable 50. Mm -hmm. You can't make an auto loading or a semi-automatic uh, man portable 50. Everybody told him he couldn't do it. He designed the initial guns in his dang garage, <laughs> like out of really crude materials. Right. And everybody's like, you're going to shoot that? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and it's just crazy, you know. He saw a need. And uh, in, in my opinion, this is one of the best man portable uh, firearms and definitely the most awesome man portable firearm that you can get in terms of, uh, let's just say a civilian. I mean, if you right. go into a gun shop and you buy 107 with a suppressor and you drop you a big old ACOG on it like this, it's a pretty formidable gun. And it's great for plinking, good for having fun. I mean, yeah, I go out and I shoot this thing and, and I really enjoy it. But it's a 10-shot semi-automatic, <laughs> 50 caliber. Uh, you know, rifle that was invented by, you know, a guy that everybody told him he couldn't do it. And to me, I to me, what could be more innovative than that? That's a lot of power. I mean, it's a lot of power to be toting around. I mean, you know, man portable, you know, I mean, gosh almighty, man, 50 caliber. I've shot, I, when Eric first got this, I had never shot one. And I shot it and I was like, oh my goodness, we were shooting that thing and it was just destroying everything that it touched. I mean, it's crazy. It's, yeah. and the different kinds of ammo you can get. It can be any personnel. It can be any vehicle. I mean, it's just, it's, it's impressive. It's It'll eat a wide gun. variety of different ammunition. Oh, They're pretty forgiving. Uh, I've never had a stoppage or a mm -hmm. failure or an issue out of it. Uh, you know, they're just great guns. Accuracy department, I mean, obviously, it's not going to be as accurate as like a good bolt gun or right. something like that, but that's not really its purpose. It's meant to have fast follow-up shots. It's meant to be a force multiplier. It's meant to, to be one of those things where you have a couple of guys with these, and they can be anywhere. Remember, in World War II, the Germans were scared to death of bar gunners. Mm -hmm. They hated men that were issued to bar because they could sneak around and jump in a ditch somewhere <laughs> and lay down a couple of mags out. out of that thing and then run away. And by the time they had a chance to either mortar them or return fire, they were gone. Yep. So the bar gunner was a feared guy for that reason. Just like on today's battlefield, you break out the Barrett, people know you mean business. Yeah, you, you, it's, it's time for some business handling. I mean, gosh, I mean, well, the 50 caliber itself, the actual round was designed as an anti-tank round. So yeah. that, that tells you in itself, I mean, how much power oh, you yeah. really have with the 50. But, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for the Barrett family yep. and Ronnie Barrett as an inventor and as a patriot. You know, he loves his country, and uh, he saw a need and really wanted to have an awesome man portable 50 for his military to use. And the, the overall kind of, I guess, motivations for why right. the gun was created. You know, he created it to fill a certain need that he saw that needed to be met. And he, he loved his country and wanted his gun. He wanted his country to have the best gun they possibly could. He definitely deserves to be mentioned in a video like this. I, mean, I agree. He, he's just an yeah, just innovative and you know you can't do this. Yes, I can kind of guy. I mean that's you know, that's what sums I, it up. And that's the American way. Right. I think that really embodies like what America is all about. Like somebody tells you you can't do something, what do you want to do? You want to do it. You want to do it. <laughs> okay. So somebody tells you you can't make a man portable fifty. I, I'm, I'm gonna make I, a man it's so neat 50. that he's just like, yep. oh, really? Okay, we're going to make a man portable 50, and then he just goes off and makes it. So. Anyway, that's our wild card, the 107, 82, if you will. Wonderful gun, very innovative. It's going to be around a long time. Yeah, longevity, it's been in service a good minute. Mm -hmm. It's They've acquitted themselves fairly well. They work well. They hold up great. You know, they're just great guns. So, guys, thank you so much for watching today's video. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we've got more stuff on the way. we got some black powder stuff on the way. Yeah, I'm excited about that. we got like some what? really cool black powder stuff on the way. What's one of the black powder guns we're shooting? <clears throat> well, we've got, uh, we may or may not have an awesome Civil War gun that we're going to be shooting, uh, a revolver uh, and an original that you'll never see anywhere else. We have pillar breaches. We have all kinds of stuff, man. Yeah, Just stay some, tuned to the channel. It's got some neat black powder stuff. So, guys, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time. We appreciate the support. See you. Thank you.